Hi, everyone. My name is Sean Augenstein. I'm going to be uh, just chairing this session, uh, the track one on optimization and systems. So we're going to be uh, running through the um, talks on the left side here. Um, first will be uh, Nicholas Lane from Cambridge, and then Mehdi Benis, Ashwini Panda, Gauri Joshi, Phil Gibbons, and Farnaz Kushampar. Um, and what uh, speakers, what I'll try to do is we'll, um, we'll try to stick to 10 minutes. You can give, say, maybe like a three-minute lightning talk uh, of uh, of your um, your work, and then we'll have you know something like six minutes for questions. I'll be monitoring the dory, and I'll um, I'll kind of let you know when we're about two minutes from um, from time. Um, that's it. Uh, so, and oh, one more thing, just want to give a shout out. There's a few talks that didn't fit into. Uh, there's no lightning uh, uh, talk session for, but we have some additional recordings. So feel free to check those out on our. Um, uh, on the pre on the what do you call it? on the workshop page uh, great so with that um, Nicholas if you want to take over and present let's talk sure and can, can you hear me yes so I just wanted to yeah give you three minute overview of the uh, talk um, so my name is Nicholas Lane I'm at uh, the University of Cambridge and then what we wanted to do was um, kind of just show you an early preview of some tools that we've been building as we go into this uh, federated learning area. And if I just advance the slide, this really is the heart of the talk if you've seen it already. It's about a tool we call Flower. Um, you can go to the URL right now, flower.dev, and use this tool. Um, the tool uh, conceptually is uh, sits on top of existing deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And what we're really trying to drive towards is allow experiments that account for a lot of the different types of heterogeneity that you're bound to see when we roll these systems out for real. So we, we looked at the literature and we found that there are some gaps in, in how people were evaluating their algorithms. So for example, how do you, um, what, what's, what's an easy tool out there that would allow me to simulate different wireless condition, conditions between the, between the federated learning clients? Or how, how would I easily um, simulate a, a, a set of um, federated learning clients where there's a big gulf between the computational capacity of, of, of some of the participants. Um, memory constraints, energy, and so on. So this, this uh, we, we really want to build a tool that could allow them to make it to be easy, and, and also scalability. So often people were um, evaluating on maybe some of the machines they have in the lab, um, but what happens if you want to run an experiment with say 100 um, clients or even 1,000 clients? So in, in this tool here, um, Flower, uh, we have a component that allows you to instantiate um, cloud instances and have them operate as different types of federated learning clients. Um, and what I'm highlighting here in this red box is really the, the key components of the tool that sort of uh, make it fairly unique. Uh, you can have mixtures of, of um, instances and real devices, so smartphones, embedded devices with energy monitors hooked up to them and so on. And, and so this is really what we want to, the message we want to get across. Um, and then in the talk, there's two interesting types of results. Um, and the idea here is to, is to illustrate what can Flower do. And so this first result is about um, a, a, a training situation where you have heterogeneity in the pool of clients. Um, the red bar is showing you if all those clients have uniform compute capacity, so all have got GPUs available. The blue bar is when we introduce one, um, one client that, can, that is uh, much less powerful, that only can use a CPU and here, Flower um, easily allows you to see that the train time goes up. So the fact the train time goes up so much is probably not such um, not such a surprise. But the but the ease by which you can do these sort of experiments is, is the real message here. And then the the sort of the cherry on top. I was saying to the folks I'm working with, saying, what could we show folks that is going to be interesting? That would be some sort of evaluation they haven't seen before. And so this final result is trying to judge the carbon footprint of federated learning by having an additional sort of model that we bake into a number of, a number of different assumptions um, uh, to estimate the carbon footprint to translate from energy um, on top of what are very realistic uh, sort of wall clock time estimates of training. And, and, uh, and, and so we can do things in Flower like this, where we're comparing a specific situation of federated learning against uh, a V100 um, trained in sort of a data center style. And we can show here that the federated learning actually has and we'll use um, 3.4 times the amount of carbon given given dozens of different types of assumptions here. Which country is it in? What's the setup of the devices and so on? And then you can instead of dig in deeper and say things like, why is that the case? And on the right hand side, I'm showing this figure that shows um, if you look at federated learning, it's the blue line 
in terms of the number of rounds it takes um, to uh, it's basically showing carbon on the on the y axis, x axis, the number of rounds. You'll see that the slope of federated learning is lower than the data center um, situation, um, but it just takes so much longer to converge to a high level of accuracy of the model. And so these are just sort of the flavor of things you can do with the tool. So, so I, that is um, basically what I want to sort of explain the parts of the talk, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, we already have a question um, up on the Dory for, for this talk, and it's from Jakob um, Konechki, who's one of our research scientists here at Google. Uh, and sure. he, said, um, uh, he says, uh, Nicholas, so the footprint comparison, FL footprint comparison is very interesting. A question yes. that raises for me is how would these compare in the overall? Um, imagine FL being easy and everywhere. What is the aggregate carbon footprint versus an aggregate data center footprint? Uh, that's more of a seed for follow-up discussion, but I think uh, in terms of what's the ubiquity the ubiquity of FL? How does that um, contribute? Well, it, it all depends on how you want to measure these things. But if you test, um, just jump in there and say the the key thing that's going to be different is is cooling. If you if you're going to uh, so data centers have this cooling component. Obviously, if you have many many devices, they will be changing the temperature of the environment to a degree. But um, but you know you have data centers that might spend thirty percent to sixty percent of their energy in cooling. Kind of these numbers vary from data center, data center to data center, but that's the big block um, factor that, that I would say. Um, and again, this is really just meant to be a, a way you can see flour being used to to kind of evaluate very different metrics. Um, that, that's kind of exciting to folks to to design algorithms that meet these sort of other sort of metrics. Can I um, can I jump in with a, a follow up? Um, sure, Jason. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, Jason Roslander. I'm on the uh, federated learning team here at, at Google. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very curious about this slide when I watched your your lightning talk. So, a couple of things sprang to mind. One was it wasn't clear to me whether you considered the carbon footprint of the network. Um, yes. Also, you did. Yes, we did. So, so it, I mean, the ugly truth when you try to do these estimates is oh, there's so many factors you have to kind of make assumptions for. Um, so we did best effort um, assumptions for the, the networking and even the storage. So there are some sort of papers out there that try to do um, called coarse grain estimates based on how much data is moving. And uh, we even found numbers that vary from different um, country to country. Um, so there, there is an archive um, paper that I can point you to that has the methodology in it. Um, okay. uh, but yes. Yeah. I was just surprised to see that the carbon footprint of the of federated learning is so much uh, lower because in a, a normal federated learning uh, setting, you know, you have to move, uh, there's, there's so much communication from edge devices like people's phones all the way over the internet to the data center. Oh, so uh, you, so you, you would, it's, so we found it 3.4 times larger in terms of carbon emission and you would think it'd be higher? Uh, okay, no, that, that does correspond to what I would expect. I would expect it to be higher because of the transmission uh, cost of, of uh, FL to edge devices versus data center. Yeah, I so guess, this is even, I guess I'm yeah. misreading. I guess I'm misreading this graph where the uh, data center uh, line appears to be higher than the federated learning. Uh, yeah, I guess I was, I was a bit careless in describing these graphs here because I was sort of conscious of three minutes, but, um, but um, yeah, you know, the, 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 sorry. You can see uh, it's actually the the um, the fair learning scenario that we assumed is actually a very powerful one. So these Jetson um, TX twos, they they can really crank things out. Um, and there's there's a 50, 50 of them participating um, to train. Well, what is a really a, quite a small model? So really, this is kind of a, 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 I would say this is a toy example too, because we would want to really see this being used is sort of you know with a giant model, lots of data distributed. Maybe even the data naturally exists on the clients, obviously such that it would have a natural advantage over the data center itself where you have to kind of ship the data to the data center versus a situation where the data would sit um, mm -hmm. on the client edge. But, but I mean, so as I mentioned in the talk, we just we thought this would be kind of interesting um, metric to assess because it's not even clear um, when is a good situation to use federated, when not to use federated for how big a model, for what's the situation, what's the powerfulness of the clients you have available and so on. So Sandy. Take a look at those things, it's interesting. Thank Thanks, you. Nicholas. I think uh, with that, we'll move on to the to the next talk. Um, sure, Mehdi, thanks. Th thank you so much, that was really, really interesting. Um, and next we have Mehdi Benis, who's gonna talk a bit about FL and networking. 
Very good. So, so, so yeah. So basically, uh, uh, today I thought to talk to you about the uh, intersection of, of federated learning and wireless communication and how we could actually benefit from from uh, from both of them. So somehow uh, more uh, more than the some of their parts. So let me just uh, finish uh, start to so some context. So uh, so why federated learning is so important in in, in 5G? Since I'm, I'm I'm wearing the hat of, of uh, communication uh, uh, scientist here. So essentially, the, the wireless networks are becoming extremely complex. Uh, this is driven, of course, by the you know, uh, new, new applications ranging from virtual reality, uh, autonomous driving, uh, and others, which make the net network very complex. Of course, data is, is increasingly generated at the, uh, in a distributed manner. This is where federated learning comes, comes to play. Uh, typically, the focus in, in wireless communication is not, not so much about privacy, but more so on latency, reliability, and, and energy. And, and, and maybe uh, uh, thanks to last year's paper uh, of, of, of Peter and Al, uh, federated learning is currently maybe top two, top three research topic in wireless. Uh, so when I say wireless, it's academia and industry. Okay. So, so now uh, what we, I mean, uh, the goal here is in fact to, to, to list down a few desideratas. So what we want to have here, in fact, in terms of co-design, one is the fast convergence of the uh, model training algorithm Two is communication efficiency. So here I'm talking about uh, successfully receiving transmitted bits of your model over the air. Energy efficiency. Uh, so uh, here I'm talking about communication. So the, I think it relates to the previous uh, question. So communication energy and then scalability. And then as we see also actually privacy can be here at, uh, obtained uh, uh, for free and, and, and motivate that further. Now, just to explain you the difference between uh, what we call digital federated learning on the left versus uh, analog federated learning on the right. So in digital federated learning, this is in fact where when you have, uh, say, a number of workers and every worker will transmit its model over a dedicated orthogonal uh, resource, could be time, frequency. And then, you, of course, you average the, the models on the base station. So, uh, I mean, th th this is obviously not gonna, going to scale very well in terms of workers because essentially you require orthogonal channels. On the right hand side, this is the new new system design here. Where actually, we leverage what we call analog uh, communication. Where here, as you can see, this is the uh, hopefully you can see my 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 mouse. Uh, so so all the all the workers, in fact, are going to be transmitting on the same resource block. So essentially, contrast that to, to the digital case. You are much more communication efficient, and in fact, in one go, you are, you're able to to transmit the model. Uh, 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 to, the, to, to, the, to the server. Essentially, what the server gets here is a uh, fading perturbed model plus some some uh, channel noise, uh, uh, essentially to recover uh, re recover the model. So there are many benefits for that. In fact, I mean, uh, I mean, you can, it's, it's, it's uh, obvious to see what, what happens when you transmit on one resource block versus uh, uh, many. But essentially, what you can also show, in fact, that uh, you can get privacy for free because here the channel will actually allow you to, to, to hide some sense of the model over the air. So this is essentially, essentially what we sought to do. So just some results here uh, to motivate this, in fact. So, so what we plot here, uh, so this is training loss versus the number of communication rounds for number of baselines, uh, the analog, uh, the digital case. And in fact, what we also wanted to compare here for fairness, we were kind of kind with the digital case. We assigned 10 times more resources to the digital case. Uh, and as you can see, I mean, the, 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 the the, the performance of the analog uh, uh, case here, which is called, so uh, this is for analog uh, federated ADMM, the convergence is much, much faster. And in fact, you need to increase the number of resources by 10, tenfold in order to, to match the performance of, of the digital case. Okay? Uh, for energy efficiency, so this is for communication energy efficiency here, as you can see, in fact, uh, uh, I mean, the, the analog case is much more low, uh, I mean, more energy efficient uh, than the digital counterpart. And you need really to wait for two things. One, you need to, to, to wait for 200,000 uh, here, a number of channels associated to the digital case. But also, you would need to require a very high uh, signal to noise ratio. Contrast to that, the analog case works even when the uh, signal to noise ratio is very low. This is the same result for the uh, image classification. So this is for image classification. Again, we see the same insight. Okay? And also for scalability here, we thought to, 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 to look at how many channels you need to, 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 to use in order to, to guarantee a given uh, uh, training loss and, and, and accuracy. As you can see again here, I mean, the analog uh, scheme, in a sense, is, is really, I mean, uh, doesn't require to, to, to scale the number of, of channels with the number of, of workers. So essentially, you get free meals uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, so just to, to conclude here, I mean, uh, yeah, so, so the code design here of wireless communication and federated is essential. In fact, by looking at an analog uh, transmission, you get this co-design uh, kind of uh, by nature without forcing it. 
Uh, then, of course, in terms of, of, of benefits, you have communication efficiency, fast convergence, bandwidth efficiency, and even privacy. So here, I, I mean, I'm not showing the proof of, 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 of privacy, but in fact, you can easily show using differential privacy that you can actually show it, I mean, uh, uh, prove it, okay? So the proof here will be a function of the number of workers, but also the signal to noise ratio. And this is something we don't really see in, uh, say, machine learning papers, because, I mean, the wireless part is usually abstracted. Uh, and then, of course, there are some limitations here. So one of them is to relax some of the assumptions. For instance, here we assume synchronous transmission of the workers. And then we want to also look at the fully distributed case with several um, in, uh, distributed topologies and uh, extending this further to model quantization, uh, knowledge distillation. Uh, this is something we, we, we worked on in the past. And of course, uh, many other uh, extensions. So I'll, I'll stop with this. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. Are there any questions? I'll, I'll ask one. Um, so uh, th this, um, I, I found this very fascinating, and th this uh, notion of um, analog federated learning, it's one that's, you know, um, it, it's sort of predicated on, I guess, a sort of a local model, right, where say this is like a cell tower and, um, you know, all there's not a sort of hop via a network. This is a hop all via over the air kind of a mm -hmm. transmission. So um, is there any sense of sort of, you know, so this is this is really well suited for local federated learning problems. Is there any sort of sense of how this could be composed with sort of an additional layer that, you know, like let's say you're doing federated learning on a larger scale um, where once, you know, once it reaches the cell tower and now it needs to get back to a data center for the server um, round, how that might be composed? So, uh, so, so, so here the idea of, of, of using another federated learning is in fact that it will scale very well, right? So this would work for Internet of Things devices, in fact, right? Uh, it would work for base stations. Say if you have, a, say in a network, you have, a, I don't know, uh, K uh, distributed uh, towers, uh, base stations, and they want to, for instance, run your federated uh, learning analytics in this case, right? So you, you could use this, but 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 it depends on the requirements. So here, if you want to, again, uh, you want fast conversions, uh, and if you're limited in terms of uh, wireless resources, you cannot use a digital approach, right? Because you don't have enough resources. So you have more workers than resources, right? And actually, uh, the performance in the digital case will get worse as you increase the number of workers because of interference. And like the analog case, where actually you not know, the more workers you get, the better it is because you're averaging much more, much faster. You see, that's that's actually like, like uh, two different paradigms in some sense. Yeah. yeah, that's very fascinating. And I think the privacy also. Oh, sorry. So I think it's some background noise. Yes. Sorry, I posted a similar question on, on Dory, but I, I'm not sure that you answered his question, right? So yeah, this works beautifully, it works scalably if, if everything's within the same listening range, um, but yes. that's not always the case, right? Absolutely, yeah, very good question. So yeah, this is why I said we, we started with the parameter server, of course, so uh, now if you have a user at the cell edge, right? So uh, uh, obviously the, the, the performance will, will deteriorate, but, but here, uh, the worker at every round will transmit its model. So even if the channel is impaired or the channel doesn't arrive at the, this time slot, you will have a better uh, channel realization in the next time slot. So you can actually average that out. It's not it's not an issue. The the the, the issue, of course, if if I mean the the, uh, the you have a if you have a, say one cell and uh, I mean you have a larger macro cell and the user is really really far, say a kilometer away from the, the base station, then obviously there is a problem for them. That's why we are going for the uh, fully distributed setting, just as in the you know, parameter server setup, right? That's why people are now moving to the fully distributed because you have a shorter range, right? You don't have to go all the way to the server and come back. You just talk to your next uh, device or neighbor. I, I still think you're not answering the question. I, 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 I enjoying the answers you're giving, but so if, if, if I'm trying to run this algorithm on users that are in, in Seattle and users that are in New York, and okay, I want them okay. to average their models. There's no way I could do it. They can't. They can't. They're not within the same wireless range. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So, so yeah. So here again. Okay. So uh, yeah, you, we need to have a confined area because again, here you're leveraging the uh, the multiple access channel of the applet. So obviously, if you get too much uh, uh, reception of of certain workers, the, the scheme will not work. Although it could work because you just need to you know average all the signals over a larger time slot. I mean, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. As a killer app or use case, yeah, you would deploy this. I don't know in a, in a in a in a neighborhood. It works well. In fact, this has been uh, already uh, demoed here in Finland. We have demoed in, in our campus, so it's actually work. It's working. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, but not from Seattle to New York, certainly not. Yeah. The glass half full, I guess. Also, by folk, I mean, in a local problem, you also avoid much of the complexities of sort of the things I think Phil's going to talk about in a little while, which is these very non ID distributions that are correlated with geography. So if you don't need to do things that are different between New York and Seattle, which for many things in wireless you don't, then it works perfectly. Great. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Thanks, Maddie. Um, okay, I think with that, we'll move on to um, Ashwini Panda, who's going to give the next talk on model poisoning. Hi, everyone. Great. And uh, we can see your slides. Yep. So I'm Ashwini Panda. Um, this work was done while uh, I was at UC Berkeley. Um, currently, I'm at Princeton, also done with Arjun and Pagaji and Pratik, uh, Professor Mittal, who's also on this talk, uh, and Sapir Chakraborty. This is a talk on analyzing model poisoning attacks on federated learning at scale. So like the previous talk said, I'm going to do a quick overview and then have plenty of time for questions. So I'm just quickly going to go into an overview of what a model poisoning attack is. So in a model poisoning attack, we have the perspective of an adversary or attacker, as I'll refer to them throughout the talk, who wants to induce misclassification on some amount of data which they have access to. And this misclassification can be thought of as a label flipping attack. Now, the attacker has quite a lot of power. They can upload any information that they want to the global server. However, what they can't do is tamper with any other gradients coming from benign agents, and they also can't tamper with the data that's being used uh, at test time by the global model. So basically, the way that they can induce mass misclassification is by uploading malicious gradients uh, that get averaged out with other benign gradients and end up putting a backdoor, that is what we call it, into the model that's learned by federate learning. And typically this is done with some kind of boosting so that we can overcome the averaging effects of other agents. So here's basically a quick outline of this talk. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about how effective are model poisoning attacks against federal learning systems at scale, uh, which is to say we have lots of clients and we have very, very low participation rates. So uh, earlier, uh, Daniel in the, you know, the very first uh, Google talks that we had talked about having you know, millions of clients uh, that are participating in 300 million clients overall. So we're not talking about scale on the order of millions of clients, but we are talking about scale on the order of 10,000s of clients, which is the scale that our experiments operate at. Then I'm going to talk about what defenses would work at scale. Uh, I'm going to evaluate some defenses, uh, talk about how they work against the attack. And then finally, I'm going to go over adaptive attacks that we came up with to bypass the defenses that we found worked best at scale, which is basically the norm clipping defense. So um, quickly, we identify this metric for evaluating backdoor attacks called the outsized impact factor. So there's a formula on the screen here. But intuitively, we can think of it as the ratio of backdoors which are successfully inserted by the attacker to the number of data points controlled, data points controlled by the attacker. The should be able to get an outsized impact factor of 1. Because if you can't insert as many backdoors as data points that you can control, uh, the attack probably is not that sophisticated or effective. And we analyzed previous work through the lens of this outsized impact factor. And we find that most of the previous work that we were able to evaluate has a very, very low outsized impact factor, um, which is to say that although the attacker ends up getting high accuracy, they aren't actually inserting a lot of backdoors compared to the amount of data that they really control. So we evaluate uh, the model poisoning attacks uh, without any defenses at scale. And we find that we can actually obtain an outsized impact factor, which is anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times larger than seen in any previous work. So immediately, this sort of sets the context that these attacks are a lot more effective than we thought. And we're going to see this theme throughout the rest of the talk, where we sort of evaluate some defenses that were previously proposed, and those defenses were previously found to be effective. And we find that actually we can break these defenses. So now we go into the defenses. Uh, and we evaluated a number of defenses and found that L2 norm clipping, which is a defense that was previously proposed, is actually the most effective defense. Um, we also have some theoretical justification for why this might be the case, but I'm not going to get into it right now. You can see it in the full talk. Um, and we tried some other defenses uh, as well, which had varying degrees of success. But as for L2 norm clipping, um, we can see that when we do L2 norm clipping, we can actually reduce the outsized impact factor quite significantly. Previously, the attack was getting an outsized impact factor of 10. Uh, but when we actually do use uh, L2 norm clipping, we can reduce the outsized impact factor pretty much down to 0 0.1, uh, 
which is a reduction of 100 times uh, without having a big reduction in our test accuracy. And we find that this works most effectively for a clipping factor of five, which is to say that we take every single gradient and we scale it down so that the L2 norm of every gradient which is uploaded, whether it's from a benign agent or from a attacker, has a L2 norm uh, at most of five. This prevents the attacker from boosting their update in order to overcome all the other benign agents. So with this context in mind, we come up with an adaptive attack. So we have a few ideas, and uh, the full ideation process of how you came up with this attack is in the full talk. Um, but basically, we combine two techniques, a distributed backdoor uh, and projected gradient descent. So when we combine these together, what the attack looks like is every attacker chooses a small fraction of the overall malicious data set, which could be thousands of data points. Uh, they take this fraction of the data set, and when they're computing multiple epochs in federal averaging, after each epoch, they actually clip their contribution down to the L2 norm clipping max threshold. So essentially, if there is a way for them to misclassify the data within the L2 norm ball given by the L2 norm clipping defense, this attack will find that, that, that update. And we see empirically uh, that we see a Pareto curve emerge where we can actually recover a outsized impact factor of one, uh, albeit at the cost of a lot of benign accuracy. Um, but this actually allows us to pretty much overcome the norm clipping defense entirely. Uh, and that is pretty much uh, the brief summary that I have for this talk. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Ashwini. And we have um, one question on the Dory. Uh, so um, this is from uh, Jason Roselander, um, who says, um, you mentioned both clipping and secure aggregation, but mm -hmm. uh, the server, what, you know, there's challenges to applying clipping in the presence of secure aggregation. So can you explain a little more um, how you interrelate the two? Yeah, so norm clipping can actually be done um, using a zero knowledge um, proof setup. And essentially, the way that it would be implemented at scale is everyone has to basically uh, compute a blinded, uh, basically just like sum, uh, because the L2 norm is actually just the square root uh, of the squares of uh, all the elements that you have. So it's, you know, again, this is something that's going to go into the full paper. Um, we basically come up with a way that this could be implemented as a secure primitive that doesn't conflict with secure aggregation, that doesn't require the uh, server to be able to actually inspect each individual gradient uh, by using a zero knowledge proof or uh, more realistically be implemented efficiently with a ZK snark. So you're, let me see if I, if I got that right. So you, you have a zero knowledge proof that the client has submitted uh, a gradient that's within the L2 norm uh, without obviously providing the actual value itself? Uh, not necessarily that the client has submitted uh, a gradient which is in the uh, L2 norm ball, uh, but m more so, you know, you compute the, yeah, I guess that, that is what it would be. So you can compute the norm uh, in a blinded manner, and then you just have to do one comparison uh, inside of your circuit. Uh, okay. And that doesn't mean that you actually get to do the work of dividing uh, everyone, like you don't actually get to clip their gradients, but this would allow you to basically discard anything which is over the norm threshold. Um, and we'd say that, I mean, that's basically uh, good enough to implement that's the option. That's great. I look forward to seeing that because I know that, yeah, I, I know that's been a problem that um, people on our team have, have looked at in the past, and I don't think they've come up with an elegant solution for it. So, uh, yeah, very, very interested to see what's in the paper. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks Thank for the question. Uh, with that, we're, we're at time to, to move on to the next talk. So um, thanks a lot, Ashwini. That's a really interesting topic. And um, when we'll, I think we'll obviously hear another version of um, when um, Vitaly Shmonikov gives his keynote a little bit later, uh, also on uh, advers adversarial uh, views of FL. So that's a really interesting topic. Um, next up is Gori Joshi from CMU, who's going to talk about um, objective inconsistency and heterogeneous FL. Gary, you want to take it away? Thank you. Uh, let me just present my. 
So uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this talk on objective inconsistency in federated learning is based on uh, joint work uh, led by my student, Jian Yu Wong, who is also interning at Google uh, this summer. Um, so uh, as all of you know, um, in federated learning, heterogeneity uh, comes inherently from the data. Uh, because uh, the devices that participate in federated learning collect their own data sets. Uh, the heterogeneity that we are looking at here is a combination of this data heterogeneity uh, with computational heterogeneity. And the computational heterogeneity manifests itself in um, terms of variations in the number of local updates that are performed by different nodes. So in most of the um, optimization theoretic analysis of federated learning, uh, we consider the homogeneous setting, where if you have, say, two workers, um, and these worker nodes um, or client nodes have their own local minimum, x1 star and x2 star, then uh, they start from a common global model and make the same number of local updates. And then these resulting models at the two nodes are averaged. And when we do this, the average solution, the xt plus 1, eventually converges to, the, um, to a stationary point of the global objective, which is what we are looking for. But what we found is that instead of uh, these nodes making the same number of local updates, if they make different numbers of local updates, and this can happen pretty often, so uh, say, both the nodes uh, perform the same number of local epochs, then if they have different size data sets, but they are using the same mini batch size, they are going to do different numbers of local updates. Or you could have cases where some nodes are faster than others, uh, where they will also do different numbers of local updates. So in this heterogeneous setting, if we just naively average models that are trained in this heterogeneous manner, then we find that the average solution, um, x t plus 1, will be biased towards clients that perform more local updates. Uh, and it will eventually stray towards this client's local minima and away from the global minimum which we want to achieve. So uh, we studied this problem of objective inconsistency more rigorously and found that uh, instead of the true global objective, um, which we want to optimize and which the homogeneous setting does optimize, uh, in the heterogeneous setting, we end up optimizing a mismatched global objective, which is given by this F tilde. And this mismatched global objective, depending upon the values of the tau i's, which are the numbers of local updates that are made by these nodes, this can be arbitrarily different from the true global objective. So in order to um, analyze the convergence and possibly fix this inconsistency, we uh, wrote the federated learning update rule in a more generalized way. So this is just a rewriting, but um, it generalizes the basic update rule. So just to recall, the basic update rule of federated averaging uh, is as given here, where uh, we look at the total local progress made by each client, which is denoted by this delta. And then we average these local progresses um, in a proportion of the data set size uh, fraction, which is PI. And as we saw before, this optimizes a mismatched uh, objective if these clients do different numbers of local updates. So instead, we can rewrite this by averaging normalized uh, local gradients instead of just the local changes. So uh, pictorially, instead of um, averaging these delta i's, which are the total movements of the local model, we'll normalize them by tau i, that is the number of local updates. So we'll get these green um, gradient directions, which are the normalized gradients, and then average them. So this is just a, a rephrasing of the update rule. But now by changing these averaging weights, we can control where our solution ends up. Um, we can show that this normalized um, gradient um, averaging rule optimizes uh, this objective function. And by controlling WIs, which are the aggregation weights, the proportion in which we average these models, 
um, we can either go back to the federated averaging update rule, or we can also encompass several other local optimizers, such as proximal gradients, which is used in FedProx, or variable learning rate, momentum, et cetera. So this is a general framework that subsumes many of the existing local optimizers. And there are some interesting insights that we get from the convergence analysis of this framework, which I'm not going to get into. But um, by just looking at this objective function, we can already see a fix for the objective inconsistency problem. So if we want to make f tilde the same as our global objective f, then all we have to do is set wi, these aggregation weights, to pi. So that's exactly what we do in a proposed um, federated normalized averaging algorithm, which we call FedNova. So we just set these aggregation weights, wi as pi, and um, then um, we can use this averaging rule with any local optimizer. So we can use it with federated averaging or FedProx or any of the other local optimizers. And just by changing these aggregation weights, uh, we can get a consistent model and fast error convergence. So these are some experimental results that show how FedNova, uh, even with vanilla federated averaging as uh, the local optimizer, can outperform um, both federated averaging and fed prox. Um, and it can also work with uh, other optimizers, such as variance reduction techniques, such as scaffold or VRL SGD. And uh, all we can have to do is change these aggregation weights, and it either, either preserves or improves the test accuracy of these techniques. So with that, I'll stop. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Carrie. That was very interesting. Um, there's nothing on the Dory as yet. Is there any um, questions online folks want to ask? I know this is definitely um, of the mind of several uh, interests of folks at, at Google um, doing research in this area. So um, yeah. Yeah, I have one. I'm Keith. I mm -hmm. also work on the Federated Learning Team at Google, um, mm -hmm. which is that I guess I thought I'm a mathematician by training, like a pure mathematician. Um, so this is where all my perspective always comes from. But um, I, I was, I thought briefly about the notion of like a global objective that federated averaging could be optimizing whatever last fall maybe. And I think in the general case, there is no global objective because the outer weights may be following a non, non zero curl vector field. So is there a, some kind of, is there like a assumption that gets one out of this case? The only examples I can come up with at the time were pathological that I kind of gave up, so. Oh, OK, yeah. so um, uh, in general, if the objective is non-convex, then we can only guarantee conversions to a stationary point. So um, when I talk about optimizing non-convex objectives, I mean conversions to stationary points here. Um, for convex or quadratic objectives, when there is a, a unique global optimum, then we can actually like show that um, um, Fed Nova can reduce that bias in um, the solution and converge to that unique global minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know whether that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I think that the I think that you know restricting the function class is is probably yeah. So there are some restrictions on the function class, which are pretty standard in the convergence analysis of optimization methods, such as uh, like some gra bounded gradient variance and Lipschitz smoothness, etc. Gary, we have a question for you on the Dory from Krishna, uh, who asks, um, does FedNova require tuning any additional parameters such as tau f? Ah, uh, yes. So that's an uh, interesting point, which I did not get time to cover. Tau f can be th thought of as like a global learning rate, which is proposed in, I think, the uh, Adaptive Federated Optimization paper. Um, it you can set tau f to just the value which is used in federated averaging. So it doesn't require additional tuning. But additional tuning may help. Uh, what we found is just by setting tau f to the federated averaging case uh, works well in practice. So we haven't had uh, to tune it yet. But it does offer additional degree of freedom. Thanks. 
Um, in the interest of time, we need to move on to the next speaker. I just want to comment, though, um, uh, speakers, if you at some point want to take a glance at the Dory, um, I'm trying to get to as many questions as possible, but there's some questions coming in later. So um, there's a comment feature on the Dory where you can respond to questions um, after the fact. So um, I would recommend just take a perusal and responding to any questions uh, that come your way. And with that, um, Phil Gibbons from CMU, do you want to take over next and talk on non-IED? Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, good. Um, so we're focused mostly in our work on geo-distributed learning as a concrete use case for decentralized machine learning. And it has uh, communication bottlenecks, just like classic federated learning. Um, and also, just like classic federated learning, the data often highly skewed because they're collected in different parts of the world. So one of the things we wanted to do is create a real world data set that, that research could use. So we've done that. It's uh, looking at mammals, um, images from Flickr. We have over 700,000 pictures across 42 mammal classes, uh, each geo tagged. And what our results show is that there's a high, as you can imagine, there is indeed a high skew in the labels across geographic regions. So this is a, a graph from the full talk it shows um, for, uh, in this case, just broken down by continent to keep things simple, um, and the 42 different mammals. Um, you can see that the vast majority of mammals are dominated by uh, just a few continents. So for instance, uh, kangaroos, not surprisingly, are the number, the fraction of images from Oceania dominates all the other continents. And uh, skunks are dominant in Americas uh, and a little bit in Europe. Okay, so indeed, uh, if you look at this data set, you will have a good example of uh, skewed distribution in the real world. Um, in general, the, the paper that, that we're talking about um, studied experimentally, uh, mostly synthetically skewed data sets uh, to see how pervasive the problem was. Um, we discovered significant drop in accuracy, which I'll show you in the next slide. Turns out one of the interesting findings that we didn't expect was that the problem was even worse or DNNs who, that use batch normalization, like the ResNets and others, okay? And uh, that the degree of skew, the amount the data was skewed determines uh, how uh, challenging the problem was in terms of accuracy loss. So this is just an um, example. We have the top one validation accuracy, and what we're comparing for uh, several different uh, models is the, the shuffled data case where we just randomly partition the data and the skewed data case where we uh, give certain uh, labels to with certain uh, uh, workers. Um, and uh, this is with just a uh, case of five partitions. And you can see that uh, compared to the, the random case um, where the accuracy is, is pretty consistent across these different algorithms, uh, in the skewed case, the accuracy drops significantly and sometimes diverges. Um, the, what we're showing here is the uh, Fed averaging is in the green. Uh, it, it suffers. Uh, BSP is the model where you communicate every single round. So it's, it's 20x uh, slower in training than these other models. Um, uh, but we looked at, at things besides just federated averaging. And similarly, for different data set, ImageNet versus Cypher 10, we had a, a huge drop in accuracy. And doing a face recognition, uh, we had, again, a huge drop in accuracy. So, Skewed data is a pervasive fundamental problem across these different applications, across these different algorithms. And uh, what was interesting, as I mentioned, is that even BSP uses signif loses significant accuracy if, for batch normalization layers, like the ResNet 20. You can see the BSP, even though it's communicating all the time, is still suffering significant loss in accuracy uh, for uh, both uh, Cypher 10 and, and ImageNet. Okay. Uh, in terms of solutions, what we showed is the, that among a whole bunch of different things we tried, that if you replace batch normalization layers with group normalization, then we got rid of this problem. Um, and then we also presented this thing called Skew Scout, uh, which I'll explain here. So Skew Scout is a systems approach to addressing this problem in which you adapt the amount of communication that's being done uh, in these decentralized uh, algorithms uh, based on the um, amount of skew in the data. More specifically, based on the accuracy loss induced by that uh, observed, okay? And the way this works is that periodically, uh, one uh, partition will send its complete model to another partition, and that, that receiving partition will look at its local data and, and compare it to the, the model 
that uh, from the other guy and see uh, how much the loss is. And if there's a huge amount of loss, that means that these models are, are diverging and so they need to communicate more often because basically there's this tug of war going on between models that are seeing very different data and, and how often they're communicating to sort of stay in sync or not. And the end result is that we only communicate as much as necessary and therefore we save um, you know, a factor of 9.6x in communication savings over communicating all the time, even in the high, most highly skewed case. And, and when things are more ID, we can save up to 34x communication savings. And again, this is attaining with no loss in accuracy, it's attaining the exact same accuracy. All right, so let me just stop there and leave the key takeaways uh, on the slide that I'm showing. Questions? Uh, hi, Phil. I was curious um, whether you considered, um, uh, you know, things like layer normalization as well as group normalization, or um, also just removing batch normalization uh, entirely, uh, because we did similar experiments in a in a similar work on resolving, you know, non-ID data for fit out. Um, the yeah, removing batch normalization didn't altogether didn't, uh, um, I, I mean, it helps in some ways, but it also you know, slows down training and things like that. I mean, there's a, there's a reason batch normalization is so popular, right? It, it, has, uh, um, it has advantages uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, smoothing things out and, and, and uh, generalization benefits and allowing you to run much larger uh, mini batch sizes and so forth. And so uh, we were looking to replace it with some other type of uh, normalization that might achieve some of the same effects. I have a question about um, the the skew scout work and the adaptive um, adaptation for skewed data. Um, in your in your recorded talk, you gave an example I really like, which is this notion of like because I always kind of wrestle with like what is to be not what does it mean to be non IID? That's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. But I think you said you know you can live in Pittsburgh and not see lions every day, but still want to know what a lion looks like if they say a lion escaped from the zoo, right? Like it's it's something you care about even if you don't have tons of examples around you. And exactly. so I'm curious, like, do you observe, if you look at the orchestration patterns, do you notice particular, you know, is there is the algorithm trying to select, say, a subset of clients on each continent? You, or are you noticing some behaviors in the orchestration to, um, uh, to achieve a, you know, convergence in the face of decentralized data. Do you, do you notice anything interesting or that, you know, it never tries to over bias too much to clients in one particular um, continent or, or uh, does that make sense? I guess, like, can you say anything about orchestration and the requirements of sort of a certain minimum set in any round to, um, of, of participation? Yeah, so this study was all done under the, the sort of standard um, optimization Approach where you're trying to create a global model that that works well on the union of all the data, right? So I, I think what what the discussions and I actually think I have that slide here. What what some of the discussions uh, that came up at the end of my talk were for things we haven't really looked studied that much yet, right? And that's like, do we have the wrong objective function to start with, right? Is, is there some sort of um, you know? weighted objective function and that we need to worry about or um, you know how, how can we keep minorities from suffering and things like that right and so um, skew scout as it stands was just trying to say uh, you know let's let's keep these models uh, enough in sync that they're not that they're maintaining good accuracy right they're not diverging right let's let's keep them uh, on track as much as uh, as BSP the, the communication heavy version would have done, um, but uh, you know, uh, with as little communication as we can get away with. Got it. Great. But but those are really interesting questions, and it's the kind of thing we're looking at now. Super. Thanks, Phil. Um, and that brings us to our last talk of this um, this round, and that's um, Farnaz, who's going to talk about um, uh, compact private DNNs and federated design of how to achieve them. Uh, sort of a, a federated auto ML view of things. 
Hi everyone, and uh, I, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about how uh, you know these different models are fitting and customizing within the different devices. So, you know, if you think about AutoML, uh, what we've done with AutoML is we've done a model customization where we take a deep learning model and then we customize it to a particular. Uh, device and we take the hardware constraints and every time you know you do this type of optimization we go through a number of compression techniques hopefully you don't really impact the accuracy but you know all these techniques from pruning to decomposition to quantization it helps us try to get some uh, compact model into the devices that have uh, you know that are uh, really uh, complying with the constraints of those devices. And now, uh, if um, you know, if uh, we are talking about this in the context of uh, federated learning, uh, the problem is actually um, quite different now. Instead of one device, we have multiple devices. It could possibly complement each other model. So you get like a part of the model. You could get part of the model into the devices. But now uh, the question is, how do you actually do this auto ML in a pre in a federated learning setting so that you know the uh, you know the different Different distributed devices are best uh, being used or best uh, having the best compression for each of the device. So uh, one thing is uh, when we have an auto ML, we are trying to uh, you know just uh, uh, fit everything into one device with the constraints. But now we are we are in effect having a, a parallel computation platform where uh, you know uh, we are not really sequentially updating the model. So this could be beneficial for our setting. So uh, just a problem setting here, uh, let, let me represent the decisions uh, in one vector. And uh, let's assume that the server is trying to uh, do this auto ML and try to decide that uh, which, which, uh, which of the uh, clients is going to get uh, what part of the model. So uh, what happens here is that, you know, the server is is going to uh, make that decision that you know how to distribute this decision to the different clients and then uh, every time this gets customized to this device and you know this helps the customizing the uh, deep neural network on that device and after evaluation a reward function comes back to the server to try to do this optimization in a federated learning setting in a distributed way uh, so here is a more concrete uh, depiction of the scenario uh, so let's assume we have access to a compute intensive, but trained and high accuracy uh, deep neural network. And then we want to have a compact version of the trained model that would run on the client devices. And the client devices can have various requirements. They could have different run times, different power, different accuracy. And then they also have access to different type of data sample. They may see a different part of the distribution of the data sample. And uh, you know they may be concentrated in certain areas, which actually happens a lot in physical settings because you may be exposed to certain physical environments and not, not vice versa. So you may actually need to do um, you know, more emphasis on parts of the model. And then uh, the, the objective here is to optimize the model to satisfy these client uh, requirements. So this is a, um, a problem formulation where the goal is to have a federated search for the optimal hyperparameter decision vector. So here, uh, you know, I'm um, showing this, and this is, uh, you know, uh, the federated search. The good thing about it is that it's parallelizable. We are based on the aggregation of the uh, various models, and then uh, we want to have uh, scalability in terms of the number of clients. So that has been the biggest criteria that we've tried to optimize because, you know, we when we started with, uh, you know, some of the traditional methods such as, you know, try to do this kind of auto ML in terms of like say by uh, iterative methods such as reinforcement based learning uh, the the we, we soon hit the prior the uh, the scalability wall uh, so the optimality here means that we want to have a uh, you know uh, optimized lower a power cost uh, or a hardware cost such as power memory and such and we want to still have a high accuracy at each of the clients that are um, doing this so here uh, you know we are uh, having this uh, you know, uh, hyperparameters that are, you know, kind of going 
following uh, you know basically the parameters at each layer and now uh, every time uh, we give uh, you know these uh, set of uh, hyperparameters to each of to what uh, set of, to the uh, each of the clients uh, they're going to evaluate both the hardware cost and the accuracy of the model and then we get a customized score and you know get it back of course you know the main challenge here is the non monotonicity of the model non convexity we have a lot of interlayer uh, correlation high dimensional space and you know if you really think about the search uh, size for something like less than 110 it became like 110 to the power power 132 uh, which is totally uh, on uh, on um, scalable uh, so uh, we what we have come up with is that we have a stochastic uh, 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 adaptive sampling based on uh, stochastic optimization and this is actually joint work with my colleague Tara who is uh, also uh, here attending the workshop and you know we are trying to maximize the probability of finding a near optimal solution by you know kind of uh, varying this alpha and uh, with adaptive sample acquisition where every time we are looking into the uh you know uh the the samples that have uh you know adaptively not come from from a distribution and then you know we we use the objective function in choosing the next um sample and uh you know we got uh you know this uh you know some some really uh great results where you know we have actually came uh, you know this stochastic adaptive method has led to a lightweight and expensive method which really did not need back propagation uh through um you know um, each of the clients uh, it uh, achieved a linear speed up in terms of the number of uh computing nodes and highly parallelizable we compared it with uh you know other uh type of optimization such as reinforcement based learning we had uh way uh you know uh way uh better uh, parallelization and uh, it was which was uh, very suitable for a uh, ferreted setting and um you know this basically uh and we have uh apis that makes this uh, automated holistic and uh fully aut automatable and uh you know the direct hardware characterization is incorporated into the policy i'm not going to go through the details here i kind of uh, skim through the details but you know just uh, uh, before I uh, stop, I just wanted to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is, you know, privacy. I work on both uh, machine learning customization and privacy. And, uh, you know, uh, what we've been looking at is we've been looking into the mixed protocol solutions for privacy. But we, basically, there is no optimal solution. And, um, you know, the uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to look into a, um, a, a combination of privacy preserving uh, mixed protocol optimization and auto ML to get the best out of the scalability and key management time and com uh, computing overhead uh, for, um, you know, uh, with this. Uh, so I just, uh, you know, stop here and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Great, thank you, Fairness. Um, there's nothing currently on the Dory. Are there any questions on the Live, anybody would like to ask? Oh, just, just one question. Um, I might have misunderstood something, but um, when you're doing the auto ML and you're trying to make the model um, more optimized for the device, um, how, how do you, uh, no, normally you make a model very small before you put it on a device. So I'm kind of struggling to see how you can have a, on the device a giant model and then suddenly kind of uh, incrementally shrink it down as you search for something all within the space of what a device can hold, or maybe you're distributing that process. So, uh, so you know, the model is actually, uh, you know, as I, you know, mentioned, like, you know, uh, the model is that the server is, uh, you know, trying to uh, kind of do the optimization. So the, uh, the, I guess, you know, I have to come back to this slide. Um, yeah, so I, I guess maybe that didn't come across. So the models that the clients run are the small models. So you're sort of using them as a samples of what it would do if you were choosing different uh, compressions. Does that make sense? So, so each uh, client is testing a different compression. Okay. Oh, I see. And, and there's server support for a pool of models. 
electrical of yeah, so, yeah, basically ah. you have many devices that are federated and each of them are running at one compression. And then you look at what the performance was, you try to approximate what the, you know, what the, the function of all possible compressions is, is, and then try to search for the maximizer there. Does that make I sense? I see. It's also a good chance to like test what the model would be like on an actual device because sometimes you have to assume how it's going to behave. Anyway. Um, cool. I, hate to, I hate to end things here um, or cut this short, but we're at 11.10 and uh, I think we'll we, uh, maybe now's a good time for wrapping up uh, this uh, lightning talk session and take a five minute break and then at 11.15 we'll reconvene for Vitaly Shmanikov's keynote. So um, I think we can, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Um, everybody's virtually applauding from the comfort of their homes. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, uh, again, the Dory, uh, feel free to ask further questions on the Dory and speakers, if you could check the Dory kind of periodically today and tomorrow and um, respond to any questions, that, that's a nice way to continue the conversation. So we'll take a five minute break and reconvene for keynotes. <laughs>